Welcome, everyone. Thank everyone. The Costume Society thanks you as well for joining us today in our series Conversations on Dress. And it's my great pleasure today to welcome to Drinks and Dress um, uh, Jamie Rice, the curator at the Maine Historical Society. Um, she is the, actually the dire deputy director for collections and programs, and uh, as a growing museum and income comparable library and statewide educational resource located in the heart of Portland's downtown cultural district. Founded in 1822, MHS is the third oldest state historical society in the U.S. Jamie began her career at MHS in 2004 as a research librarian and archivist. She's always been interested in how museum collections intersect with research materials, as well as ways to explore history by weaving together archives, objects, research, and genealogy. The clothing collection at MHS was a hidden gem, and we're so excited to learn more. Uh, when Jamie's duties evolved to include overreaching collections care, she saw real opportunity in bringing it to light and engaging a new audience. In 2017, Jamie spearheaded a project to improve preservation and access to the clothing collection, and as a result, learned so much about why historic clothing matters. And our cocktail for the evening is the main mojito, which will be posted in the chat or the uh, non-alcoholic version uh, as well. So um, enjoy a good muddle of mint and blueberries uh, and some club soda. So Jamie, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to Drinks and Dress. I'm so excited to have our conversation today. Thank you, thank you very much for having me and thank you to the Costume Society for giving me this opportunity to share more about the project uh, at Maine Historical Society. So uh, this evening, I'm gonna go through a series of illustrations that talks more about the collection and more about the project to um, better preserve and provide access to the collection. And then of course, the exhibition that uh, is sort of led us to what we are here tonight. And so Northern Threads, Two Centuries of Dress at Maine Historical Society is an ongoing exhibition, which actually closes in a few weeks and has been a year long exhibition at Maine Historical Society uh, in conjunction with our own 200th anniversary, um, different two centuries and the clothing's on display, but we'll talk a little bit more about that. So I'm coming you, to you here tonight from our collections management facility in the outskirts of Portland in uh, Akasisco, in Micmac, Kosek, uh, in Abenaki, in the land and waters stewarded by Wabanaki people for over 13,000 years in what is today Portland, Maine. So the collections management facility really features very strongly in the story that I have for you tonight because it provided an opportunity for Maine Historical Society to provide uh, more space, more breathing room for the historic clothing collections. In 2014, Maine Historical Society and the Portland Public Library teamed up to purchase a set of warehouses in the outskirts of Portland and kind of a condo association, if you will, where we have two separate buildings that we manage for our growing collection needs. Uh, the Maine Historical Society's side uh, of the complex is about 18,000 square feet of uh, collection, climate control collection storage, which provided the opportunity for us to improve the housing of the clothing collection uh, amongst other things. As you can see from these photos, which were taken relatively recently, it's a bit of a hodgepodge of shelving and what have you, but I'm very excited to say that in the next couple of months, through some funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities, we'll be installing over 5,000 linear feet of compact storage. So it's very exciting, and the, uh, the clothing will be pretty excited about that as well. So most of the activities of Maine Historical Society, the public-facing components, as well as some collection storage, is in Congress on Congress Street in Portland. You can see sort of this combination of historic and modern um, locations. And we have the Wadsworth Longfellow House, which is sort of the central component of our campus, uh, dedicated the childhood home of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, the Brown Library, which is tucked back behind there, which has been the headquarters of Maine Historical since the beginning of the 20th century. And then on the left side of the screen is the museum building. So until 2017, the museum building on the second floor is where the historic clothing collection lived. And so I'll talk a little bit about the collection at Maine Historical Society. 
which is um, loosely divided into three categories. We have uh, garments, uh, predominantly for uh, women's wear, uh, accessories, and military uniforms. So those are sort of the three loose categories for the collections. And um, the garments, which was the central part of the project, is uh, predominantly for people who identify as women with, to a lesser extent, men's wear and children's wear. But that's the, sort of the largest portion of the collection is the garments. These are stunning. Yes, the beautiful. So we have sort of that three-piece suit here on the end. We've got a uh, an embroidered vest from the 1780s for Portland's first postmaster, and then to the children's wear this great 1930s snowsuit, which um, really would not stand up to a main winter, um, even on its <laughs> best day. But early on, uh, so we've been collecting since 1822. Maine Historical Society was founded in 1822. And um, in 1901, the Wadsworth Longfellow House was gifted to Maine Historical Society through a bequest to um, build our headquarters. And at, around that time, and really up until about the 1990s, uh, the collection was relatively small. And it was much stronger in pieces from about the 1820s through the Civil War. So you can see from these pieces here on the right, we've got this Gigo sleeve wedding dress that's associated with the extended Wadsworth Longfellow family from the Mercy Owen Richardson. And then the two pieces to the left, the center, another Gigo sleeve, a beautiful purple silk from Eastport, Maine, which is way up on the coast, as well as this piece, which is a great sort of day to evening. You can, it has sort of short sleeve bodice, also from the Eastport. So really kind of this, second quarter to like mid 19th century was our strength until 1990s. That dress, that, that dress on the left, that fabric is fantastic. What yes. is that? I mean, it's silk, it looks like obviously, but yes. the print or the weave is really wonderful. It's a fantastic print. And as I mentioned, it has kind of two bodices where you can take this one off and then there's a short of sort of day to evening combination. So it's a three piece which kind of lends to like we have about wow. three thousand pieces in the garment portion of the collection, but combined it's about eighteen hundred ensembles. Lots of this mix and match kind of thing. Same within the middle. That's actually a coat over the dress that's belted, so it's a two piece. Oh wow, on that's fantastic. The one in the middle is really is is a stunning piece. Yeah, the one in the middle is really wonderful. Is and it it looks like it's piping. It's piped all the way around. Yeah. It has uh, like a yeah, little piping like on the self -piping. It's so lovely. It's really amazing. So Eastport at this time, sort of that, you know, um, really about after the War of 1812 through the Civil War was a huge bustling port, one of the largest seaports on the East Coast. So you really see some some really quality fashion pieces from those times. Really, people had a lot of access to the fabrics, to the fashions, and sort of oh, the yeah. kinds goings of all these people from Europe, especially after things opened back up with the British after the war. So some really amazing pieces from Eastport. But in 1993, Maine Historical Society received a very large transfer from Westbrook College, which is in Portland, and was uh, ceasing as a degree awarding institution and transferred its very large collection of clothing to MHS and really shifted the the um, the focal point of the dates to about 1880 to 1940. Oh wow! And this this little watercolor postcard or whatever this is is just adorable. Yes, it's a great it's an architectural rendering by one of Maine's premier architects, John Calvin Stevens. We have a big architecture initiative, so I had to throw some architecture in here with this great little watercolor. It's much larger. This is just a little detail, but a, a really stunning piece and. Um, and sort of, you know, I, I think the Westbrook College collection really shifted our focus. It really has has made a large difference in what we have uh, accessible in the in the in the collection. Um, and this their collection really grew out of their theater department and mm -hmm. out of their fashion merchandising department. Mm -hmm. And that really shifted the, as I mentioned, this sort wow. of the, of this. So we've got this great orange piece from Bergdorf Goodman on the end. Nice little 1930s. Uh, yes, lock. that's amazing. And then some 1880s, sort of, and then turn of the century pieces as well. 
these are really some of my favorites uh, in the collection, especially the brown silk with the cut velvet. That one is, is really great. lovely. So the collection before coming out to the con to the storage facility that I'm at now was very densely packed into the second floor of the museum building on Congress Street. And mm -hmm. not a lot of space to be able to review the collection, catalog the collection, or really kind of provide the, the necessary resources. I have to say that looks like a theater costume storage room. Yes, it, it's well, it, it's a, it, it certainly felt like one. And uh, but you know, when I had the opportunity to curate the uh, Maine Historical Society's World War One exhibition, military history is a great interest of mine. It's certainly an area of expertise, and Maine Historical has a lot of material from the First World War. We actively collect during the war itself and shortly after. Okay. And so I really wanted to feature some of the clothing in that exhibition. You've got two uniforms here, but I had maybe about a dozen other pieces in the show as well. And that's where I really was working heavily in the collection and noticed uh, firsthand, uh, you know, really working more with archives and manuscripts, which is my background, hadn't had a lot of experience with working with the museum collections at MHS, but really saw the, the tremendous need and opportunities for the clothing collection. And that's when I put together a project to uh, move the garments to the offsite storage facility. And through a collection stewardship grant through the Institute of Museum and Library Services, we were able to make that project happen. Excellent. So took the collections from the Congress Street location and moved them to the Riverside Collections Management Facility, which despite its name is not next to a river. I don't want any curators to, to be upset by that. It's just a designation. But, but I um, do appreciate that you it, refer to it as the condo of costume, of right, costume it is, collection. It is the condo of a, a association. So our chief curator at the time, <laughs> Um, Kate McBrien and I put together a great team, uh, Abby Zoldowski, our costume curator, Gail Dodge, who took a little, all the lovely photographs that you'll see tonight, as well as um, several interns that were funded through the project, Kyla Temple and Molly O'Donnell. And then, of course, Jacqueline Field, who's our consulting historian, who as many of you may know from her work on silk, who also happened to work with the Westbrook College collection before it came to Maine Historical. So we're very fortunate with that. And so here we are, this is the project. So the focus of the project was the garments. The accessories in the military uniforms were sort of beyond our capacity. We did move them, but they didn't get the same treatment as the garments with the photography and the upgraded uh, cataloging. Hopefully a phase two, but it's still, still work to be done. And so, as I mentioned, we moved the garments out to the offsite storage facility, cataloged the garments, uh, in, we use Past Perfect as our content management system, so every piece got item level treatment. And then, you know, Abby's a trained conservator, so you know, some some lightweight uh, conservations, or lots of preservation, placing them in the boxes, getting them off of the hangers, all the sort of things that one needs to do. And then the photography, dressing mannequins, and photographing all of the garments in the collection. Some of the military uniforms because I couldn't resist, but all of the all garments. All of the garments? All of the garments in the collection. How many, okay, so, whoa, hold the phone. How many did you do? Because you well, just said you had about 3,000 yes. objects. So about, is that 1,500 1800. garments? It's about 1,800 pieces, and then snuck a few of the military uniforms in there as well. Wow, you photographed 1,800 pieces? Dress, that we dressed the garments, and then it's about 1,800 pieces in total. Wow, that's amazing. They were very efficient. <laughs> that's fast. I mean, uh, we'll talk more about digitization, but um, like that, how long did it take you to accomplish that? It was about a two-year project. Okay, well, okay, there you go. Um, 
because in some digitization projects that I've worked on with Dr. Monica Sklar, which I've talked about before, and with other members of Cost of CSA, we do have been doing this, some of this work, and we can get through about 50 objects in two days, just given the dressing and the mounting and the, the whatnot, and whatnot, uh, you know, uh, entering clear and concise cataloging and metadata. So this is amazing that, uh, yeah, that's fantastic. Kudos to you. Yes, it's a lot of very efficient dressing. And uh, in, in Gail Dodge, the, our photographer who had experience working with, with costume photography before uh, is just amazing in how quick and how quickly and efficiently she's able to edit the photographs. Because the editing is what kills you. Yes. Especially the velvet with all the little lint, no matter how many times you vacuum, it's, not, it's still gonna be little tiny pieces of the lint. So um, she was, yes. it was that the velvet coming, she was always, Yes, so it's very exciting to have to have that project. But again, the garments focus the accessories in the in the military uniforms. We hope to be able to have as a second piece. So these are you know the cataloging item level cataloging, kind of cleaning up legacy cataloging new pieces, um, and then of course the more we promoted the collection, the more that comes in. So any kind of new acquisitions and so forth, and to be able to have all these pieces. So they're all available at the item level through our Past Perfect Online, and then the project also created a portal on the main memory network which is our online digital history platform that contextualizes the collection. These great essays authored by Jackie Field that gives you know, the chronology of the collection, the strengths and weaknesses, how people in Maine access fashion, and, you know, and, and to talk about um, what, what you will expect to see in our collection. So these great essays about outerwear, which is obviously a big focus because we're in Maine, but we've got a lot of great outerwear and then um, other contextual pieces about the fabrics. Because we collect Maine pieces, pieces about Maine, pieces made in Maine, sold in Maine, worn by Maine, but we've been in business for a long time. And so some of these pieces, you know, were just old pieces given to Maine and we still have those. So it's a little bit of the backstory of what we've collected and what we collect. That was going to be one of my questions for you is, um, it sounds like you're still actively collecting one. Yes, yeah. And um, and what, how have you, you know, with the, with the bringing in of the, of the school um, and your collection growing, how have you developed or guided or sculpted or whatever um, your collecting mission? Like, how do you keep that on track with what you're collecting? Well, that's, I mean, it's really, at the moment, we really try to have a strong, now Maine is a very seasonal place and there's lots of people who identify with Maine who may not live here all year long, lots of summer people. And so we we do, we, we can cast a pretty wide net when it comes to Warren and Maine, but we really try to focus now on Warren and Maine, made in Maine or sold in Maine with a retailer's label and those sorts of things. But um, we do keep pieces that either came from Westbrook College or came into the collections early on that aren't necessarily have any of those features, but are significant or fill a certain gap we have in the collections that so. so you're saying if everybody in the audience tonight descends on you because we're wearing things in Maine, we right. could leave our clothes behind. Exactly, exactly. But um, but you know, if but if we already had a lot of those things, then we just have to be more cautious of it. It's it's hard to turn. I mean, I'm sure everyone here, and it's hard to turn things away, beautiful items and and that. But um, without a strong main provenance, we just yeah. have to limit what we can take, understandably. Yeah. And then so here you can see some other examples. We instituted a we have like a film strip viewer where we're able to find. So not only did we photograph the garments, but we did detail shots. Uh, sometimes mm -hmm. it's two or three, front, back, right side profile. Sometimes with pieces like this, you've got a lot of detail shots. And all of these are very high resolution on the main memory network site. And you can browse through the detail shots at the bottom. So main memory network is a curated set of the whole collection. Yes. And with that, you get interpretive content. So it tells you about the garment, the fashion history to an extent, and then something about the wearer or the retailer, if those things are known. So in this case, this belonged to a woman named Mary King Scrimger, who was an inventor in Lewiston, Maine, turn of the century, had these beautiful dresses made by a local dressmaker. So we know all this information and we share that, but that's curated content. 
Fantastic. I have another question for you. Yes. <clears throat> so did the um, photography of this, was that also supported by your IMLS grant? Yes. The photography, oh, the, the moving of the collection, the rehousing, the item level cataloging, and the photography. The last two of just the garments, but moving the whole thing. IMLS supported. Um, and a good portion of the money was earmarked when we took the Westbrook College collection in 1993. In the early 2000s, we went through sort of an initial overview and removed, you know, redundancy or pieces. We kind of pared that down and auctioned those pieces off and earmarked those funds for a future project. And so that collected interest and was able to provide the necessary match for this project, which is also really great for us to be able to Fantastic. do. Fantastic. The reason I am, I'm asking about this is many collections and many people around the country are are in some stage of digitization at this moment because of coming out of COVID and making people aware of the resources that are available to them through IMLS or other granting organizations, even sometimes, depending on where you're at, an internal grant may be a way for collections to, to move to a level. I mean, you're at a very high level of digitization with what you're doing here, as well as with the camera scroll and the, across the bottom, as well as the really rich metadata that you have. That's fantastic. Thank you. It's a digital history. We, May Memory Network's been online since about 2000. We were very early in the digital history platform, and it is a really big part of what we're doing. So I think we're fortunate to kind of have the systems in place to be able to support that. But uh, but again, I think it's really to the team. I mean, it's it's amazing how much they were able to achieve in the time. Well, and connecting up with main memory, which is essentially the uh, I'm going to assume it's your you know much like Calisphere the the um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's the sort of statewide historical library system and network. Right. It, yes. yes. So, so where historical societies can connect up to and libraries and all these other sort of organizations. And so, so it's a great way of getting your, um, your collection out into the world in an accessibility way. Yes, and completely free and supported and anyone with main collections can participate in main memory. Um, it's all free. The training's free. The hosting's free. Everything about the, you know, and again, uh, generously supported through the Institute of Museum and Library Services uh, throughout its. So the yeah. the federal the federal support has been very generous to to us o over the years. And so all of this work with the collection and uh, really kind of culminated in the Northern Threads exhibition, which. Um, is as I mentioned, two centuries of dress, about 1780 through 18 through 1980, which is really the kind of the, as an archivist, I would say bulk dates of the collection. We certainly have pieces that predate that, and we have pieces up to the present. But that 200-year period is really the strongest um, pieces. And each it was a two-part exhibition that turned over in the height of the summer, and each piece had a signature garment, which you can see here. And I'll show those a little closer. Oh, that green dress is stunning. Yeah, the green dresses, that was the opening piece, one of the most amazing things. So each one of these two parts had a series of vignettes that spoke to the strengths of the collection. And then each had a section we called Silhouettes in Sequence, which was a chronology. So I think that, you know, it sort of wanted to be able to show people the evolution of the, the women's wear silhouettes, but also to feature lots of little vignettes. Uh, part one really featured... Um, Civil War garments uh, in military uniforms, of course. The Gigo sleeve, which is a big strength of ours. Uh, mourning, which mourning jewelry tends to be more of our focus. We have less mourning clothing, but we have a, we have a little um, adaptive Ooh. reuse, which is taking older. Do you, have, older do, you fabrics. do you have a collection of hair jewelry? Oh, we definitely have a collection of hair jewelry. Ooh, so exciting! I love hair jewelry. Hair jewelry, <laughs> hair rees, the whole. We've got a lot of hair jewelry. Definitely more jewelry in the morning, and morning photography is also a specialty of, uh, of ours as well. Oh, interesting. We've got. Uh, we also did some outerwear, um, the deconstruction of the bustle, and then sort of these pieces. This was 1780 through uh, 1880. And this is the installation here. And this was the signature dress for the oh. first half, which is a, a beautiful lightweight wool dress. It was purchased by, at a Boston retailer, 
but by a woman named Hannah Adams who lived in Belfast, Maine, but she hand embroidered this herself. Wow, that is stunning. It's really beautiful. And a very small waist, which was very fascinating to everybody who came. I think it's a 13 inch waist. Ooh, that is very small. Yes, and she was an adult, which was also surprising too. I mean, of course it is one thing, but 13 inches is pretty serious. <laughs> yeah. That trim is amazing. And yeah, like kind of the next time I put something like that on stage and, and the performer is like, oh, this gets in the way. I was like, no, people seem to work with it. Yes. Well, the sh their little chenille pom-poms, they're just really uh, amazing. They're this is lovely. A stunning, stunning piece. So kind of that, you know, that, kind of second phase of the bustle with that long, I guess is a cross kind of extended, um, extended bodice, really a beautiful piece. And then we opened each one of the parts of the exhibitions with a piece of indigenous clothing, which isn't, there's isn't a lot of representation in our collections, but we had a, a contributing, um, historian Jennifer Neptune who authored essays about how Wabanaki clothing or indigenous clothing was collected by museums sort of what that means and we opened this one this is a pair of uh, beaded Penobscot moccasins that the artist it was is is unrecorded but were uh, given or acquired by a man in the in the Bangor area of Maine about the 1830s it's really amazing piece mm -hmm. that's beautiful and then we had a couple of educational components really about the environmental and the economic impact with a kind of a, a microcosm study on the fur trade, which was very influential in positive economic and detrimentally environment, environmentally uh, decimating to the beaver populations in New England, in Maine, and uh, and along the, the Canadian, the eventual Canadian border. And so as an opportunity to show how fashion impacted Maine in this region in different ways, focus on on the fur. And when, as, as many collecting organizations of our type, we have a lot of beaver fur hats. And so it was an opportunity to really show the differences of those and the evolution of those. And then the population of the beavers going from about 400 million to about 150,000 by 1850. Wow. Pretty serious with them. So it's really kind of an educational opportunity with those pieces as well. And then weaving the kind of genealogy and research, which was be more my specialty. Here we have a wedding dress from the 1830s and then the granddaughter wearing it uh, for a photo shoot in the 1890s cabinet card and as a way to kind of tell the stories of main people in their families and how collecting, how garments are collected and preserved and how they make it into a historical society collection. That's a stunning dress. That fabric is gorgeous. It is a really beautiful, beautiful piece. And we've got it in, in great provenance, which is a good piece. And so this is an example of one of the garments that has no main connection other than the fact that the great granddaughter lived in Maine in the 1920s. So it's an English court dress. And we, this is an example of how the research that we've conducted sort of kind of, um, um derailed the story that kind of came with the dress it was supposedly worn at the court of george the second but it's more appropriate for george the third and by that time the wearer uh, who it was associated would have been deceased and her daughter was married to a patriot likely not at the english court of george the third so lots of sort of backstory but nonetheless beautiful english dress brocade fabric and uh, here it's pictured without its stomacher, which unfortunately in the collections doesn't survive, but a really great way to talk about sort of um, documentation. And nonetheless, without its main provenance or solid backstory, it remains <laughs> in the collections. We all have those family lores. Yes. <laughs> But still, but fewer of us have an 18th century gown to go with it. Exactly, exactly. We do have this other green dress in the collection that is pretty amazing. It was fabric from the 1740s, made into a dress from styled like the 1770s during the 1820s for a ball for the Marquis de Lafayette that was held in Portland, sort of as like a costume homage to him. So that's also another great story. <clears throat> 
but sharing these stories, I think, is that public history approach was really kind of the focus of our of our collection and really kind of where that. So some other great examples, this beautiful woven hat from Newry, Maine, which is very rural uh, Western Maine to kind of demonstrate that people in rural Maine communities in the 1840s, 50s and 60s had access to fashion, were interested in fashion. Um, it is not just a coastal or had to go to Boston kind of thing. And then the adaptive reuse, taking older garments and making newer ones here. We have the 1840s bodice made into an 1880s. And um, it's amazing that these two things survive together. Wow, that is amazing. So they literally harvested half of that bodice to make yes. the other one. And probably the skirt, I can only imagine because there's just not enough fabric taken from the bodice. So probably they took the skirt to create this that neither skirt survives, but they're just the two bodices, but it's amazing. The transition. Yeah. So we did a little mini exhibit in the Wadsworth Longfellow house, this great little watercolor of the house of family clothing. We've got this lovely Spencer jacket and then this. Uh, oh. this that Spencer jacket is just adorable. It's very cute for Zilpa. This is Henry, uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's mother. It's her Spencer jacket and then her dress, which she purchased either in Stamford, Connecticut or New York, it's unclear, but there's some letters at the National Park location that talk about when she went on a little buying trip and this was one of the pieces. But some really great uh, fun things. So this was just a little kind of short-term exhibit while the other two exhibits were turning over where we featured the pieces in the house itself, which um, was just very short-term because of the climate. And that sleeve uh, that you have um, in the detail photo that has this sort of kind of Shakespearean quality to it with this with the um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Not really scalloping, but dagging possibly or whatever you you know that cut work that it's doing. It's really kind of wonderful. Yeah, it's a really Renaissance sort of Romeo and Juliet kind of inspired. Bit, yeah, that dress used to actually be very light pink and has faded and only in the crevices of the, the folds of the fabric can you tell what the color was, but it's pretty evenly faded to this kind of, I don't know if taupe's really the right word, but like an ivory mm -hmm. color, but it was mm -hmm. at one point pink. So here we have, this is the, we're going into the second part, which is the green and red dress, which was featured at the beginning. This stunning dress, one of my favorites. Uh, this is part of the Westbrook College collection. Most of the Westbrook College collection pieces that are on exhibit are part of the second, as I mentioned, because of the date. So it's about 1890 through 1980 is the second part. And um, unfortunately, we don't know the wear or the dressmaker, but this is an example of this dress is just too amazing to not have in the collections. And the collecting habits of Westbrook College is part of the main story as well. So we can justify that with this for this stunning piece. And then a uh, Penobscot beaded collar and cuffs, which um, which is the sort of opening indigenous piece for this part, which was amazingly purchased at auction by the Penobscot Nation with support from us and the Maine State Museum just uh, about a, um, I guess a couple months before the show went up. So this was the first time it had been back in, in Maine in over a hundred years. Oh, wow. That is so beautiful. The beading is amazing. The work is just fantastic. So again, another essay that really talks about the collaboration, which is really what the the Cuff and Collars is really about. It's about collaborations and it's about the three institutions joining together to to make this purchase. So it's, it's with the Penobscot Nation Museum, uh, but they lent it to us um, for this exhibition. And then just a couple more. So we've got for the second half, we did, again, a silhouette sequence. We had a outdoors, which we don't have a lot of outdoor collect, uh, clothing, despite being a very outdoor focused. So this was really a call, it's almost a call to action for people to, if they had everyday clothing or kind of work a day or fishing or hunting or hiking or had those kinds of materials that we're really looking for that material, but it's not a lot of what survives in the collection, you know, more focused on evening wear and specialty, which is more likely yeah. to be preserved. So we really wanted to focus on that. And I'm pleased to say that since this exhibition has gone up, we've received some really stellar pieces um, in, in relation. That to leather that. jacket is just wonderful. That's a great jacket. It was Maine's first female aviator. Oh, wonderful. 
1930. Um, oh my goodness. You can bring it Evelyn back later. Dunham, That's fine. I think. Evelyn Dunham. I'll look, yeah, I'll both send that to you, but it's a, it's a great from the Queen City Flyers. I do remember the name of the club. Excellent. <laughs> and then we had some uh, designer clothing, sort of dressmaker to department store, and sort of the evolution with design with fashion. Um, some great pieces from uh, locally made. And then, of course, as people start, Lord and Taylor, Jeffrey Bean, and then some a really nice example of one of the most the few couture pieces we have in the collection from Jesse Franklin Turner. We have three dresses, Jesse Franklin Turner dresses, one of those. So it really talks about sort of cocktail attire and how people access that kind of fashion. And then bridal, of course, because of course, yes, some beautiful pieces for that as well. And then here we did another educational piece with the fur. This time fox fox fur in the 20th century was big business in Maine, especially during the depression. And so we talk an opportunity to talk about fox farming and um, the environmental and well, and the cruelty and the environmental aspects of uh, fox farming. And then uh, I mean, eventually outlaws fox farming in the 1950s, and sort of the story along those and some of the pieces from the collection as well as some ostrich feathers and other kind of um, you know, animal related accessories as it were in the collections. And then again, to weave the story of the genealogy, this wedding dress is for uh, Bessie Rodis, who married a Greek immigrant. She's from New Hampshire, um, married a Greek immigrant who was living in Portland. But I think the really amazing thing about this, this is a beautiful dress. And but the story, when Bessie's mother, who was from New Hampshire, married her father, who was a Greek immigrant, Bessie's mother, Blanche, lost her American citizenship because of the laws in the United States. Oh. And by the time that Bessie married her husband, who was also a Greek immigrant, she didn't have to. So that was just one generation, the ways that those laws have changed for um, for women and women's right to be able to retain their citizenship in the United States, born in the United States and, and marrying an unnaturalized man is, is a really interesting narrative that we, you know, had to be able to tell that through the dress, I thought was pretty amazing. This is a beautiful dress. That lace work is fantastic. It's really amazing. And her um, granddaughter works at Maine Historical Society. So it was also really great to be able to. Say. Oh, that's wonderful. Yes, who gifted the dress to, to us. So does this dress, does the lace work on that dress, it looks like it comes up the side back and then wraps yeah. into, it does? Fantastic. Yes. That panel that's just under the, the the breast kind of goes all the way around mm -hmm. and down the back mm -hmm. and two side panels. And then there, it looks like there's a little panel in the sleeve as well, right at the same. Yes, where right, at the the same, right at the same. Right at the same with you. Yeah, Perfect. that's yeah. wonderful. Which is really interesting. We have another cocktail dress with the same lace work that was owned by a different person. That uh, the, the lace is almost identical in the in the cocktail dress. Two different people, two different collections came two different ways, but really um, must have uh, had some kind of local origin for for the lace or the accessibility to. Them. Yeah. And then here's just a quick. So all of the mannequins, because we certainly don't have, we have probably about 50-ish pieces in each one of the installations. And all of the mannequins were made out of FOSS shape and were custom made for the garment so that we could display them. And so here's just kind of a piece. So our, um, so Abby Zoldowski and uh, Vivian Cunningham are intern from the Maine College of Art and Design. Uh, we got a grant from the Kobe Foundation in New York to um, help put on this exhibition and they helped fund our uh, fantastic intern who has since become an employee at Maine Historical Society and they built these mannequins out of false shapes so they're hollow and then yeah. our facilities manager made these great like crossbar kind of supports and we were that's how we were able to show all of these garments without having you know, 50 plus, not to mention the really unusual shapes and sizes going from a 13 inch waist, 1880s to, um, you know, to a men's Civil War jacket is is a quite a range. So they all custom made uh, these pieces. Yeah, no, false shape is an amazing material that allows you to, 
you know, really create some of these mannequins at a very reasonable cost. I mean, yes, very reasonable. Um, it was, it's, it's great. Very reasonable. It, you know, it takes some time and, and it takes some time getting used to how that, you know, how much shrinkage it does and how to actually manipulate it. But once you have the hang of it, it moves quickly. So we, uh, Abby, they, the team kind of sewed these kind of gray necks, wanted everything to really be gray. And then, of course, like during the pandemic, gray stockinette like didn't exist. So they added all these gray necks and these gray shoulders to the pieces uh, throughout to um, to kind of have everything be a neutral color across the board um, for both ones of the um so we had some online programs. We've had some great speakers that have kind of come over the last year with the initiative, all of which are available on our website um, and uh, some great publications, book talks. Uh, Ned Lazaro from Historic Deerfield, who studied a number of garments in our collection and then some people from really all over the country. So the online programming has been really great and, and well received. And then- Looming uh, also... trends, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> looming trends that's excellent <laughs> we also did a virtual tour uh with matterport so the first the, for the first part it's online and uh when the second part comes down we'll have a second part on on there so i think wow, that's, that's the end of the of the slides as uh, i have to to share tonight um, um jamie this is fantastic uh so i just want to say i so first of all beautiful stunning garments and in terms of what it sounds like you're doing you're such on the cutting edge of trying to um make your collection accessible to people online in terms of with the virtual uh work as well as with the digitization so thank you so much um your 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 you know many collections around the country are trying to figure that out and are grappling with it and are just starting and covid real through that they realized that you know oh wow we can do other things in this way it really shifted our thought processes um in our in our disciplines in terms of how we can present things. And so it's just wonderful to see um, the work that you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. It's It's been a real pleasure. And um, you know, I, as a librarian and an archivist, I, I, I didn't, as I mentioned, didn't have a lot of opportunity to work in the collections, but as my role here evolved, um, the, this project has really been, um, has has really demonstrated sort of that transition into working more broadly with collections and making collections accessible, which is the primary focus of my job. So it's been really exciting and fortunate to have a great team and really great teams to be able to share that. Excellent. Okay, so now we're going to open up to some questions in the chat. I wonder if the purple was a step out of morning black back then. Oh, I think, well, I think at the time that the purple, at least from the research that I can tell, that the purple was just, was a really expensive fabric and more of a luxe fabric. So I don't think that that particular purple would be a step out of it. I think that that was an intentional choice outside of the morning scope. I think during the 1830s, when that one was from, that, um, that sort of that sort of transition into purple maybe wasn't as... Um, I think it would have been a lighter purple. I guess that's right. right. I have yet to figure out how to make them sturdy mannequins. My steaming doesn't seem to make them strong enough. Maybe someone can do a CSA Zoom presentation on boss shaped mannequins. Yes, it's um, again. I think that the the um, the crossbars that were inside of them, and we had kind of a wooden plug at the base, and then had like a PVC on the inside, like a T. That's what really got them to be straight because i would agree the the squishy you know but to keep them so that you can keep the structure and then really padded out all the other features so it was really just kind of like a core yeah that yeah i love how the plaids are matching even on the skirts and the <laughs> sleeves uh did the mannequins also have arms for the sleeves in some cases we did use a stocking arm but in, in other cases, uh, we didn't. It depended on the garment. Sometimes the garment needed it. Sometimes it was just a little bit of tool or batting or something to give it a little fluff. But 
not always. Jamie, thank you so much. This has been just delightful and really fun and a great way to end the year. Um, the garments that you have are beautiful. I now desperately want to come and see your collection and your condo association of costumes um, and, uh, and, and, and see what you have there hidden away. It's been really delightful. Well, so thank you. thank you so much for your time. Um, and uh, and thank you for sharing all of the work that you've been doing with digitization because it's really a key thing that everyone is facing right now um, and it's great to know that you have such an online presence through um, main memory so that's really wonderful thank you so um, much for me. it's been a real pleasure yeah. Um, so once again, it's been wonderful and lovely, and thank you all for attending. Please follow Costume Society on Facebook and Instagram, and make sure to hear about our, all of our upcoming episodes of Conversations on Dress. Thank you all.